Our second speaker is Assistant Professor Martina Decker in the College of Architecture and Design, who focuses on how smart materials can offer solutions to contemporary challenges in sustainability, health, and safety. Professor Decker makes use of material engineered at the molecular level to change their size and shape, to store and release water, to repel water, to generate or conduct electricity, or to change their color. She investigates their properties, discovers their capabilities, devises architectural applications for them, and fabricates prototypes that demonstrate their potential as high performance materials in building projects. Professor Decker. Thank you very much for the very warm welcome, um, not only here to the symposium today, but to the school in general. And um, can you actually turn down the lights a little bit for me? Because I can't see a thing. Or maybe I have to go to the front as well. And I wanted to definitely thank uh, Dr. Bloom and the entire community to welcome me to the school. And I want to show you some of my work and make a point why collaboration is so important for us in order to actually find solutions to the problems that we're facing these days. Now, my research brings me to materials that have been engineered on the nanoscale. And when we contemplate the nanoscale for a second, um, we think about our fingernails. One second is enough to make our fingernails grow by one nanometer. So this is a product uh, of nanotechnology and all products with the structures of the material um, when they're uh, smaller than 100 nanometers, they count into the category of nanotechnology. So the RISC nanocar is roughly two by four nanometers in size. And when we think about our fingernails within four seconds, um, our fingernails have grown by an increment that is many, many times larger than this miniature uh, invention or miniature version of a car that is actually driven by light. So this is the scale that we're dealing with. And you can only imagine that the nanoscale actually encompasses so many different disciplines that we have to ask ourselves the question if we're actually dealing with the, one of the emerging general purpose technologies. Another question that we should ask ourselves is, is it of the same magnitude as previous examples that we have seen in history, like the steam engine, electricity, automobiles, or the computer? Many researchers find indicators for that, and there, if you look at the science citation index, especially since the 90s, there has been increasingly mentioned uh, or there have been many publications that actually refer to nanotechnology and it is similar with uh, patents actually very interesting you know, the spiking in 2004 and it keeps continuing to grow so this is a technology that will bind us all together and interdisciplinary uh, will actually encourage us to work together i think in particular, in, in architecture, there is a huge potential when we're able to create materials um, that will help us to create sustainable environments. So now we have this unprecedented control over matter. We can build materials molecule by molecule and give them very, very specific properties. And if we start to ask these questions, and demand from our materials to do certain things, then I think we have a responsibility to do that actually in a sustainable manner in order to create environments that will help us um, basically wean off the fossil fuels. As you can see right here, this is from uh, 2010. New data is going to come out at the end of this month, but I don't think that we have been able to actually decrease the, the fossil fuels that we're using. Now, interestingly enough, 41% um, of the energy that we use in the U.S. is being used in uh, buildings, which is really where the architect comes in and where the architect has the responsibility to do something about it. It actually gets more dire when we look at electricity in particular, and still fossil fuels being the main source of, of our electricity, and then 74% of the electricity that we produce is used for buildings, in buildings, and for their operations. 
And if I dissect that a little bit more in architecture, then you can see heating and cooling roughly actually makes a quarter of that. And this is really where in my office we try to tackle, um, or this is the, the first problem that we try to tackle with uh, some of the research that we have done in the past. So the smart screen, actually one of the earliest projects that we had in the office, and it is still a, an, an ongoing investigation, is a screen system that uses a smart material. This uh, smart material, or smart materials in general, count into that genus of material, into this category, if they are able to respond to their environment. So you have an uh, external input or some changes in the external environment and the material will react. This particular example uses a shape memory alloy that can change its shape due to changes in ambient room temperature. Very simple actually when you think about it. If you have the screen, you have a cold room, the screen is open, the room warms up and the screen closes. And this will greatly assist our heating and cooling systems and it will help us tackle the energy uh, that we usually put into those systems. Now how does this actually work? As I said, this is a materials motor and we do not need any electricity and we don't need any sensors in order to have the screen operate. What you see in the middle is actually the nickel titanium alloy on the molecular level and in the simulation you can see uh, shape memory alloy spring on the bottom and a regular counter spring on the top. So simultaneously you can see what's going on on the molecular level and what the actual effect is that we can catch with our, our eye. So at the cold state, the regular spring that you see on the top is able to overpower the shape memory alloy spring and deform it. As soon as the material warms up, the shape memory alloy will want to go back to its original state and it becomes stronger and works against the counter spring. So they're in a constant tug and war. And as long as I create these little um, atomic bonds happy, if I don't break them, if I don't deform them beyond a certain point, we can get millions and millions of cycles out of this actuator and it will not stop um, operating. This is uh, the first prototype or a part of the first prototype that we produced where we had materials engineer this particular shape memory alloy spring which you can see on the top here and gear it towards uh, room temperature between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. Um, it's a very uh, um, small cycle actually for a shape memory alloy. Usually they need um, changes in temperature that are much larger, but the scientists were able to actually just dope the nickel titanium with certain impurities which allowed us to gear it to that very small increment in between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. When you think about that little movement that you're creating, it might not look like much, but if you apply it in a smart system and in a smart design, this little movement with a certain amount of strength that it has behind it can actually operate the screen system. You see the piston that is actually in the middle of the springs can rotate the roller that you see on the top and then openings in the screen align or misalign in order to either allow the sun into the room to warm up the environment or it closes in order to block the solar heat gain. Now this is the springs that you saw earlier in a test that we have done documented over the course of a day. So in the morning, of course, it was cold because from the cool night air, the, the test environment was cool. You see the sun coming up and the system responds and closes the shade. Now at night when the sun goes down and the system cools again, you will see how it opens. So this is one example of an artificial muscle that we use in architecture that we can utilize in architecture in, in order to actually assist different systems. Now, in a second series of projects, actually, that we have been working with, um, we have been looking closely at carbon nanotubes. They have been in the press for a while now, and for a very good reason, because they're a fascinating material. Not only are they incredibly strong, they are also excellent thermal and electric conductors. And, but like with so many different uh, building blocks that we use in our environment, we have to use them in a smart manner. If we use an I-beam and we install it wrong, it will collapse. It will not take the, the weight uh, that we, if, 
apply to it. And it's the same with the, the carbon nanotube. So here's an example where a carbon nanotube forest actually buckled under compression or the tubes can collapse. So it is very important to apply these materials in a smart manner in order to harvest their amazing properties. And one of the first uh, properties that we looked into is actually their electric conductivity. And I have to say, one of the, the reasons why I was so excited to come here, actually a number of researchers that are part of the NGIT community really shaped my knowledge of uh, carbon nanotubes in particular, uh, Professor Safar Iqbal and whose papers I've been reading and following for a while inspired actually the next uh, series of tests that we've done. The, this is a, a way that we try to, to create surfaces that are electrically conducting and we created something which we call the nano ink which is simply a mixture of carbon nanotubes, water, and a surfactant, and we applied it to different surfaces, trying to increase the conductivity for flexible electrodes. Um, you saw it being applied to cotton fabric and cotton swabs, but also we used um, a very simple office paper that you can get at any corner store, and dipped it into the nano ink, and you can see how the LED lights up here on the side as soon as the electric circuit is closed. We've also retrofitted a, a printer that uh, allowed us to print these electrodes. And uh, after arriving here, uh, I, I met uh, John Federici, who showed me his printer, which is a lot more professional than what we have done. And I was very excited to actually see the resources that, that you guys have here and was extremely excited and was offered to, to get access to that. So the research that we continue will be, of course, a lot more professional. So after the first tests and the uh, measurement of the conductivity, we wanted to actually create an electrode that is purely made up out of um, carbon nanotubes. So we synthesized the bucket paper. Here you can see my partner, Peter. First, he measured out the, the carbon nanotubes, mixed them in with water <clears throat> and a surfactant, sonicated the entire mix, and then sent it through a filtration unit. And what is left over on the top of the filter, the residue, is entirely composed out of nanotubes, which um, are caught on the filter very much like you would catch spaghetti in a strainer. Um, they are only 1.2 nanometers in, in diameter, but they are several microns long, so that actually enabled us to synthesize this bucky paper. One of the darkest man-made materials ever, and extremely flexible, as you can see in this video, and highly conductive. Now, <clears throat> we assembled or used these flexible electrodes for another type of muscle that we've used in our research. It's an ionic electroactive polymer, and depending on how you apply the electricity, or how you switch the poles around, it will bend in one direction or another. This happens because uh, <coughs> the ions that you can see within the polymer here will migrate to one side of the material sample or the other, and it will create a swelling of the material on one side and sh shrinkage on the other, which means that you actually have a bending actuator that will enable you to create systems. And, and we still stick closely to the facade systems because that is where we identified an area where we can make uh, or basically decrease our energy needs. So what we imagined was this continuous ribbon that would basically allow us to control solar heat gain by flexing and moving. Now, we were not entirely happy with that type of actuator because it actually requires to be installed moist and it has to be moist in order for the ions to migrate properly. So that brought us to our next uh, muscle that we looked into, which is a dielectric elastomer uh, that what you see here is two electrodes, the silvery surface, and as soon as you apply electricity, they're going to be attracted to each other, which will elongate and stretch the polymer that is in the middle. We thought about the electrode, thinking about the bucket paper that we had just created, but at the same time, once you zoom into that material and have a closer look, the carbon nanotubes enable you to have a, a flexible electrode, but not really a stretchable one. So, 
There is a number of, of different researchers who are looking into creating stretchable electrodes, which would be very beneficial for that type of system. And through a very controlled buckling system, um, researchers at North Carolina State have been able to entice nanowires to take the, sh take the shape of a coil, which would enable us to stretch the electrode by 104%, which would be extremely beneficial in the context. Since we're not quite that far yet and we wanted to work with that muscle a little bit more, we started using a product that is from Danfoss actually, that uses silver electrodes on both sides of the polymer, which are applied in a corrugated manner. So as soon as the polymer stretches, because the electrodes are attracted to each other, they will just even out. But that really limits the, the movement of your actuator. So this is really a very small increment that you're working with. And as you can see here, as soon as you apply a high voltage to the electrodes, the movement is not as big as you would want it to be actually at the end of the day. So there's still a fair bit of research to be done. Nevertheless, we designed an actuator that would work with a minimal movement as you've seen just right now. And what you see here in, in light blue is a flexible core that is wrapped in that silver muscle that can, depending on how you apply the voltage, open and close again in order to control solar heat gain in buildings. Now since the material is the motor and the shading device at the same time, this is an extremely lightweight shading system that can simply be adhered to the inside of a double skin wall system. And as I said, since the material is the, the motor and the shading device itself, you can imagine how you can activate it at any given point of the ribbon, and you have a very, very high degree of control over the system. Not only in order to block solar heat gain, but you can also direct and diffuse, diffuse light through this. Considering how we're building today and how increasingly transparent our architectures get, this can only be beneficial in general. And this is a simulation of the, the material. Actually, it's just a, a one-leaf simulation. And this would be a, a mock-up of the, the a tiny segment of, of one of the pieces within the system. But you can see from my work that it is extremely important that uh, I emphasize that I cannot do this by myself and I don't think anybody can put a dent into the issues that we are dealing with today, which is why I am so excited to be part of this fantastic community already. And thank you very much for coming.